Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual Archaeological Research Facility here at Virtual Berkeley. Um, I am Jordan Brown, one of our grad students here and your host or co-host of the Arf Brown Bag series um, this, uh, this year. I'm here with Professor Benjamin Blackman, who's going to be speaking, speaking to us today. Um, uh, before we get started with the talk, I want to let folks know if they've got any announcements uh, to please go ahead and share those um, in the YouTube chat and we'll, we'll flag them at the end of the talk. Uh, and uh, for, for my part, I would like to announce uh, next week's brown bag, um, which will be given by Dr. Megan Dennis um, from the Alexandria Archive Institute uh, on digital archeological ethics and virtual place. Um, so we're very excited for that next week. Um, same time, same place, uh, same virtual place. Uh, we'll begin today, as usual, with uh, land acknowledgement modeled on that developed by the Native American Student Development Office in partnership with the Muekwa Ohlone tribe. We consider this a working formulation, which will be replaced with language reflecting the particular position of the ARC community and developed in collaboration with appropriate stakeholders. The archaeological research facility sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We hereby acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people, that every member of the ARF community benefits from the continued occupation of this land, and that it is our responsibility to support indigenous sovereignty and hold the University of California accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. This week, Professor Benjamin Blackman will be coming to us from the Department of Plant and Micro Microbial Biology here at Berkeley. Um, work in his lab uh, aims to connect genes, phenotypes, ecology, um, all to address uh, the genetics of adaptation, the evolution of development and, and gene environment interaction um, in the wonderful world of plants. So uh, today's talk um, begins with the, the story of Native American farmers living 4,000 to 5,000 years ago who transformed the common sunflower from a highly branched wild plant with small discs and small seeds into a staple oilseed crop that sports a single large head with large seeds on an unbranched stalk. And a time series of archeological samples spans the majority of this domestication period. So this talk will discuss the use of endogenous DNA sequences retrieved from these samples to reveal how human cultivation altered sunflower genetic diversity through time. Um, if you've got questions during the talk, please put those in the YouTube chat and we will relay them uh, to Professor Blackman um, at the end of the talk. And without any further ado, I'll turn it over to him for recovering data from dead disks, tracking domestication syndrome evolution in sunflowers using ancient DNA. All right, well, thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, Jordan, and let me just share my screen. Okay. All right, well, it's a real pleasure to be talking to you all today. Um, I think I last gave ARF seminar in fall 2019, and so this will be um, a bit of an update um, from what I talked about then, um, as well as a bit of a rehash. And so hopefully uh, you'll learn something new along the way um, and see some of the promising work that we're, we're currently doing and aiming to do. Uh, and I'm going to start with this collage that illustrates the abundant diversity and complexity that we see in plants and nature. Um, and I, I do so to make two points, the first of which to say that my major interest is understanding how all this incredible diversity arises. What are the molecular mechanisms um, and ecological forces by which uh, populations adapt to their environments and through which new species arise? The second point that I wanna make is that at first principles, all of this abundant complexity can be uh, described by a fundamental equation from quantitative genetics. And that's the differences in phenotype among individuals are due to either changes in the underlying genetics, differences in the environments organisms experience over their lifetime, or a change in how those two factors interact. And in my lab, we study all three uh, components of this equation, trying to identify genetic differences that uh, make crops different from their wild ancestors or local populations adapt to their local habitats. Um, the plastic changes that happen during development in response to the environment 
uh, as well as how there are genetic differences among populations or among crops and wild varieties um, that uh, affect those responses such that different populations respond differently to the same sets of cues. Uh, but today I'm going to focus specifically primarily on the genetic component of this equation. I'm going to focus on a particular type of plant diversity, and that's the diversity that arises during the process of domestication. Um, so uh, we can define domestication as a process by which wild species are changed at a genetic level through generations of selective breeding to benefit the interests of humans. And like any process that happens over time um, through genetic change over uh, many generations. There's lots to sink your teeth into here of interest. You know, there's, there's history, there's evolutionary change, there's uh, you know, interesting genetic mechanisms that are involved as well as the relationship between all of that and the uh, human cultures that these crops are evolving with and uh, for. Um, and domestication is, you know, a really important uh, subject of study because it's been the economic foundation that has led to the growth of human cultures into large civilizations or empires over the course of human history. You know, the consistent yields uh, that are uh, created through agriculture have led to increased population densities and in doing so then lead to the diversification of um, occupations and uh, other things so that um, there can be greater urban development, um, uh, increase uh, devotion of time to cultural um, pursuits like art and writing. And of course, crops themselves have high cultural value, whether that's for dyeing textiles as fibers um, uh, in construction uh, as cuisine, and of course, as uh, fun beverages. And so by studying crop history, we also study how humans have evolved alongside crops. Um, like with any process that happens over space or across time, there are several fundamental questions that we're interested in understanding, all of which can often be controversial for any given crop. So the, the first um, question is, is when domestication happened. And during that domestication process, um, how much genetic diversity was lost as a consequence of uh, domestication? You know, often by subsampling the diversity present in uh, a wild ancestor, less genetic diversity makes it into the cultivar. Um, and a current controversy in the field is whether that loss of genetic diversity happens strong and early or whether that uh, genetic diversity is eroded more slowly over time during the course of domestication. Um, in many crops, uh, whether that crop was domesticated once in one location or several times in multiple locations is often a source of controversy. Um, in part because uh, both archaeological and molecular data can be somewhat misleading on this uh, point without full genomic information, um, and also because signatures of past evolution can be obscured by current um, admixture uh, and interbreeding as crops move to new locations and breed with local wild um, relatives. And then finally, uh, many uh, plant biologists uh, and evolutionary geneticists are interested in identifying the specific genetic changes that are responsible for um, uh, evolving the domestication traits, um, you know, increased grain size, seed size, less branching, all of those things, um, because, you know, those genes can then be um, targets for looking for variation for further breeding today. Um, or for gene editing um, to create varieties to cope with the um, stressors of our modern climate. And so today I'm gonna to tell you what we've been learning about these three things in the context of sunflower domestication. Even though I used this visual gag last time, I'm gonna use it again because I think that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, and that's that that plant uh, on that cover is not a wild flower. So wild sunflowers are highly branched plants with many small heads and small seeds. And it's only with cultivation that they've evolved uh, into um, the, the single stalked large head, large seed uh, plant we're familiar with today. Um, while I'm on the topic of misconceptions, I've been teaching uh, intro bio this term, um, uh, sort of the plant and organismal biology section, and uh, the textbook also uh, has a misconception in it, um, Campbell Biology, which I really like as a textbook a lot, but um, this just hit a little close to home because this is related to something else about sunflowers that is often misunderstood that, that I study in my lab, and that's how 
uh, sunflower stems track the sun. So sunflowers are named for and famous for their iconic behavior of the stems facing east in the morning over the course of the day, turning to face west by dawn, um, uh, by dusk, and it reorient back to face east in anticipation of dawn. And the caption here implies that this is happening while the plants are actually in bloom, but that is not the case. So cultivated sunflower heads don't track just the growing stems. The tracking stops by the time the plants bloom because the stem is not growing any longer. So you can uh, see a stem doing this here, um, where over the course of the day, the uh, apex uh, bends, and this is happening through asymmetric cell elongation on either side of the stem, such that it faces uh, west by dusk, and at night it reorients back to face east in anticipation of dawn. Um, and so all of this is happening before they bloom, and so the caption that by facing the hot sun during the day, the floral heads become warmer uh, is, is incorrect. Blooming flowers end up just facing east. The tracking stops as they bloom because the stem growth, which is necessary to sustain the tracking movement, stops by the time the flowers open. Um, but by facing east, it does make them warmer. So um, we have, and this is related to other work that we've done in the lab, and that uh, uh, greater warmth does help attract pollinators, um, but it's unclear whether the chemicals are really what's going on. So through experiments that we've done in our group and with our collaborators at Davis and Stacey Harmer's group, um, we've shown both, uh, we've uh, done experiments where we glow plants up in pots in the field, um, and let them uh, grow until they bloom. And then at that point, we leave some of them facing east and we turn others uh, 180 degrees to face west. And when we do that and just see what's different, one of the clear things that is different is that the east facing plants warm up more quickly in the morning. And we can show that both by forward looking infrared photography as well as by tracking temperature with thermocouples hooked up to data loggers. Um, and one consequence of that is indeed that the plants uh, do attract more pollinators specifically in the morning. Um, and so this question raised, this observation that we've made raises a couple questions. One of which is, is there a direct connection there between the pollinator, the increased pollination and the increased temperature in the morning? Um, and so we repeated this experiment again. Again, we grew plants up in the field with pots um, and we turned some to face west. And when we did, we warmed them up with a radiant heat lamp, like the type you might uh, sit under on a restaurant patio. Um, but here we're uh, fueling it with a propane take, which we can tweak to make the temperature that the heads are experiencing while facing west match the ones facing east. Um, and you can see that we did that relatively well here, and that if we add heat to the west facing plants, we can match the temperature profile of the east facing plants. And when we do that, we recover a good amount of the um, uh, pollinator, the difference in pollinator visitation between east and west facing plants um, with that heat treatment. Um, and so this clearly indicates that um, uh, being warmer in the morning is what's responsible for that. Uh, but as far as that uh, more proximate mechanism that warmer plants are releasing more volatiles to collect, to attract those pollinators, that's something that's still uh, the jury is still out on. And I think that there's multiple things going on here, um, in part uh, because uh, one of the other things that uh, we've observed differs between east and west facing sunflowers is that um, besides volatiles, which may vary um, in coordination with this, there are differences in rewards uh, and the timing with which those rewards are presented to pollinators uh, in the morning. So um, if you follow, say, uh, the floret, let me use my spotlight one sec. Okay, so if you follow the floret here with at this arrow um, at uh, Zeitgeber time 1.25, that just means uh, 1.25 hours or an hour and 15 minutes after dawn. Um, if you follow this, you can see that the pollen, uh, which is bright yellow, is popping out of the top of the anthers of that floret um, at about an hour and a half after dawn for an east facing plant. But if we follow a floret on the same day for a west facing plant, you can see that it doesn't really come out the top of the anther tube until perhaps just starting to at about three hours after dawn. Um, and so there's a delay um, in pollen rewards and there may be other things that differ between east and west facing plants um, that explain this. Anyway, that was a long tangent to uh, 
uh, deal with another uh, sunflower misconception that um, is common and that we study uh, in my lab and um, have other work uh, relating to too. But now I'll turn to um, the story of sunflower domestication and what we've been learning about it using DNA recovered from archaeological samples. So sunflowers were domesticated about four to 5,000 years ago by Native American farmers living in the Eastern and Central United States. And it's at that time that you uh, begin seeing in the archeological record that uh, disc sizes increase and seed sizes increase. Um, and sunflower was cultivated uh, for millennia um, for, for its seeds and the, the nutrition of the, um, uh, inside them. Um, the sunflower seeds were ground as meal or the oil was extracted both for um, culinary and for ceremonial purposes. Um, the cultures in the um, American Southwest had varieties of sunflower that um, actually produced a ton of red dye in the seeds. Um, and those dyes um, come, like bleed right out of the seeds if you drop them in water and those were used for dyeing textiles. Um, it's really only within the last 100 to 150 years that sunflower has become the major oil seed crop that it is today. Um, this, this actually involved what I like to think of as an international junket uh, in that it, were, uh, it was actually Russian breeders who really took the first interest um, in developing sunflower as a seed oil crop. And in part, that's because the um, Russian Orthodox Church banned all sorts of animal fats um, during Lent, but sunflower oil um, uh, was A-OK. -okay. And so because sunflower grew well enough in that area, um, there is a large demand for it, which drove breeding um, and uh, sunflower, and, or sorry, American and Canadian sunflower breeders jumped on the bandwagon within a couple decades as did other breeders around the world, uh, developing the oil seed lines that, that we use today. All right, so um, my main concern today is going to be thinking about this initial period though, the, the domestication that happened over the last four to 5,000 years uh, and um, to study this, uh, my group has been collaborating with uh, two anthropologists, uh, Bruce Smith um, of the National Museum of Natural History, as well as Chris Gramillion at Ohio State, um, and then with a, um, uh, a lab, Tom Gilbert's lab at University of Copenhagen that specializes in extraction of DNA from um, ancient materials and particularly uh, ancient plant materials. And together with them, we've assembled a time course of um, archeological seeds and disks that span the history of sunflower domestication. So through radiocarbon dating of these samples that we've gotten permission for uh, destructive sampling for from the museum collections um, where they're found, uh, they, uh, the oldest ones we have date back to as older than 3,700 years ago, and they, they span this whole range as I'll show you um, in the next few slides. Um, we've also been working with um, ethnic, what we, what we call ethnographic land races. So these are collections that were made by ethnobotanists within the, and anthropologists within the last um, 100 to 150 years or so uh, from Native American communities, um, but do not contribute to any modern germplasm. So there are extant land races, so cultivated lines that haven't been subject to a wheat breeding uh, in the oil seed or confectionery seed um, industries, um, and, and instead represent sort of heirloom varieties of Native American cultures. Um, but there's actually very few of those um, that remain. Um, and so by sampling the ethnographic land races as well, which also do not reflect a history of very recent breeding um, uh, for um, uh, modern agriculture, um, we can expand the a look, expand our look at sort of what cultivated sunflower looked like um, uh, in domestication rather than modern improvement. Um, and so, uh, with these samples, our ultimate goal is to follow the history of domestication genes over time. So, my lab has been identifying candidate domestication genes. Um, through doing population genomic analysis of modern samples of extant land races and extant wild samples uh, to identify um, candidate selective sweeps um, and the genes within them that might contribute to sunflower domestication. But with this archeological time series and following those sequences uh, over the last four to 5,000 years, we hope to piece together to the extent that we can tie particular genes to traits 
how the sunflower domestication syndrome was assembled over time. Um, so I'm gonna tell you more about uh, these samples and then how we've gone about using them and how they address the several questions I raised about domestication early in the talk. Um, oops, going backward, okay. Um, so these, these archeological disks and Achaeans come from several sites and mainly those sites are distributed within the Ozarks uh, as well as in caves in Kentucky. And that's be, even though there are archeological sunflower remains elsewhere, those remains are largely carbonized. Whereas the samples found in rock shelters and caves are all desiccated instead. And that's necessary if we're going to extract endogenous DNA content from them, carbonization um, that destroys the DNA such that it's uh, nearly impossible to get, uh, if not fully impossible, to get a full genome. But as I said, we've done our radiocarbon dating and created this archaeological time series. And in the disks, what we can see is the dis disk diameter increases over time, but that uh, increase is not sort of monotonically always growing. The biggest disks are not the most recent disks. Uh, the biggest disks are actually ones that date to about uh, 13, 1400 years before present. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I have several hypotheses about why that could be, and also whether that's tethered to seed size evolution or not. Um, we can see seed size also growing over time in the seeds that we we're able to sample, but we don't have recent seeds um, to look and see whether they also keep increasing or whether the seed size um, uh, plateaus or goes down um, in those uh, smaller, more recent heads. And so to look at whether disk size and seed size are evolving mosaically. Uh, we've been collaborating with Dan Chitwood and Michelle Quigley at Michigan State to take X-ray CT uh, 3D images of um, the disks that we've been working on to try to uh, suss out whether these two things are connected. And this is a really wonderful technology, which you can you know, do these beautiful reconstructions that allow you to um, see what's going on in your samples non-invasively. All right, but uh, those results are still um, in the future. And what I wanna tell you about now is what we've actually gotten from our uh, archeological DNA studies. And so these efforts have been um, largely moved forward by Nathan Wales, who is a postdoc in the Gilbert lab and then came here to Berkeley to do a postdoc with me for a little while before then uh, going on to his own position uh, now at University of York. And Nathan, you can see Nathan here in the bunny suit um, in the clean room extracting DNA um, from ancient samples. Um, and Nathan did a wonderful job and uh, what I thought was gonna be really risky turned into something that um, uh, yielded great results and that from these archeological samples, we were able to obtain a good amount of DNA for doing sequencing and learning what's going on. Uh, so the x-axis is years before present with the past to the left, and then the y-axis is the amount of endogenous DNA content uh, of the sequencing reads that we obtain from these samples. And so you extract the DNA, you um, take those DNA fragments and bundle them uh, into a package that can be read by a sequencer, and some of that DNA from an archaeological sample will come from the, the, the sample itself, whereas other bits of it will come from the microbiome uh, that has contained contaminated that sample and degraded it over time. So fungal and bacterial content, for instance. Um, and so the, the higher the endogenous DNA, the better the preservation. And you can see even going back to 17, 1800 years ago, we're getting samples um, that uh, have over 50% of the reads being endogenous content. Um, the preservation gets worse as we go further back in time. Um, I think in part that's because some of the samples are disks rather than achenes, those, um, those sunflower seeds within the seed coat um, are pretty well protected and have much better DNA content than the seed coat. Um, but also they're, they're just old. But the, um, even with that, that lower amount of content, by using sequence capture technology, we can enrich for the sequences that we care about and follow them over time. Um, so this data here is coming from just a whole genome shotgun approach uh, to see what we get. And the DNA does look ancient. Um, so as you look at samples uh, that are older and older, what you find is that the DNA is more and more fragmented as shown um, here on uh, the right and that the older samples, this one from um, say uh, 3000 years ago, 
uh, has DNA fragment links that are more like 43 base pairs long versus uh, an ethnographic section, which is only about 100 years old that um, you know, most of those are quite long. Um, there's also telltale uh, patterns of DNA damage where cytosines are converted um, uh, to other nucleotides um, over time. And you can see those transitions happening at fragment ends, indicative of ancient status. All right, so with this whole genome shotgun data, we just lightly sequenced these samples to make sure we were getting endogenous DNA content that following it up with sequence capture to get the genes we cared about uh, was gonna be worth it. But even with this uh, low amount of coverage, um, which for the nuclear genome was you know, often less than just less than one, uh, uh, less than one X coverage per individual, um, we do have plenty of plastome genome coverage. And so I'm gonna tell you some about what we've learned about uh, the three questions, when, where, and how sunflower is domesticated um, using this at least to start. Uh, so what I'm showing you here are the um, reconstructed uh, chloroplast genome haplotypes um, from our archaeological samples, as well as the ethnographic samples and then modern cultivars, land races, and uh, wild sunflowers. Uh, and the way you read this is that uh, each uh, circle represents a particular DNA sequence. Um, and the size of that circle represents the number of times we observe that same sequence in multiple individuals. Um, and then the hatches along the lines that connect the circles are the number of nucleotide substitutions that are different between the two circles it's connecting, the two sequences it's connecting. Um, and so what I want you to focus on first is that we do see signature of an early domestication bottleneck and that if you compare the circles that are green that are coming from wild individuals, um, there's many more different types of sequences present than if you look at the archaeological samples, which are in yellow, which are primarily clustered within two major haplotypes that I'm calling here class one and class two. So even um, uh, early on, it does seem like there was a strong loss of diversity in plastome sequences. Um, we see further loss of diversity in that if you compare the archaeological and ethnographic samples to the land race samples that are extant um, cultivars uh, that can be grown, um, there are se sequences that are present in the archaeological and the land race samples that aren't present in those modern um, Native American cultivars. Uh, and then finally, there's even further loss of diversity with modern improvement for oil seed lines and that this one major class that we of uh, sequence that we see in archaeological and ethnographic samples and the land races is totally absent from oil seed and confectionery lines. So over time, we do see an early bottleneck, but we also see additional losses of diversity throughout. Um, this is consistent with what we see for uh, the nuclear genome. So even though we had uh, very low coverage of the nuclear genome, um, sunflower is segregating for, um, wild sunflower is segregating and cultivated sunflower are segregating for these very, very long chromosomal inversions that can often be tens to hundreds of, um, uh, uh, kilobase, of yeah, kilobases in length. Um, and because of that, uh, they, um, there are often many uh, polymorphisms that are indicative of one chromosomal orientation versus the other orientation. And so we can genotype for particular inversions, uh, whether an individual has that uh, one orientation or the other across time. So for these uh, six inversions um, that I've looked at here, uh, if we compare what's segregating in the wild, you can see that these inversion polymorphisms, um, you either have both, you have both homozygotes or the heterozygote present, but then for five of the six of them, the archeological samples are fixed or nearly so for one homozygotes of one of the orientations indicative of a bottleneck. Um, and that bottleneck holds as we move forward in, into the future. So it looks like there is an early bottleneck there too. Um, and then not using the archeological samples, but just working from modern data. Um, a grad student in my lab, uh, Peter Stokes has been applying modern population or current population genomic methods uh, using a tool called SMC++ uh, to use modern genomes to look at the dynamics of population size 
over time. Um, and so the way that you look at this here is kind of in contrast to uh, other graphs that you usually see in that ancient or old is on the right and modern is on the left. So as you go from right to left, you're moving from the past to the present. And then on the y-axis is the effective population size. Um, and so what you can see is that both for um, wild samples um, as well, which in red, as well as land race and ethnographic samples, which are represented in um, green, you see that there is a decrease in population size over time going from about 100,000 years to 10,000 years in the past. This is on a log scale on the x-axis. Um, uh, and that part of that likely has to do with um, the dynamics of the, the ice age. Um, that, that ended about 10 to 20,000 years ago. Uh, but then around the time of domestication, about three to 5,000 years ago, you see that they split and the uh, land race and ethnographic samples continue to lose diversity going toward about 1,000 years ago, at which point uh, they, they start increasing in effective population size, likely due to the spread of their cultivation at that time. So both in our archeological samples and in our modern samples, we see signatures of an early uh, bottleneck that continued to get bad over time. The last uh, aspect of demography that I want to point your attention to uh, in the archaeological samples is that there's turnover in space uh, of what sequences are present in space and over time. So, you know, if we're thinking about this, we have samples from the Ozarks as well as samples from elsewhere, and we can look at them over time and ask what sequences are present where in what time periods. Um, and so if we look at our oldest samples, both from the Ozarks and outside the Ozarks, what we see is they have these class two haplotypes primarily, but then as we move forward toward the present, the um, Ozarks, uh, instead all of those samples have the class one chloroplast haplotype. And if we move further forward in time, we see that the class two haplotype has replaced the class one haplotype again. And then even further into the present, we see the class one haplotype has replaced the class two haplotype. Um, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what this means. And certainly I wanna look at the nuclear data to see what parallels it, um, but it could indicate that different cultivars were being um, grown in this area at different times, perhaps by um, different residents, um, or that with breeding, different maternal parents became the uh, more used over time. Um, and hopefully by exploring these DNA data further, we'll, we'll get some more insight into that question. Okay, so the second question I wanna address with this data is a question of single versus multiple domestication centers of sunflower. Um, and as I told you earlier, sunflower was domesticated um, in the central and eastern US in the Eastern North American domestication center. Um, however, uh, and it was thought for a long time that sunflower wasn't being cultivated in Mexico until after Europeans um, arrived in the new world uh, and trade routes were established from north to south. However, um, archeological remains were discovered um, in the last 20 years um, in Mexico that, some, that were identified um, putatively or actually as sunflower on the date to the pre-Columbian period, raising the possibility that there was a second domestication center or certainly alternatively that there were trade routes established from north to south earlier than anticipated. Uh, and so um, we can look at our DNA data to see uh, how it reflects this um, and whether uh, land races from Mexico are more closely related to um, uh, the archaeological samples from North America than they are to wild samples from Mexico. Um, this is work that um, we've done in the past just with modern samples and um, using microsatellite data. Um, the population structure clearly indicates that um, land races collected from um, uh, Native American groups in Mexico um, show stronger affinity to wild plants from Eastern North America than from um, Mexico itself. Uh, and if we use our archeological samples to look at this as well, uh, sorry, not our archeological samples, we don't have enough data from them yet, but we will. Um, uh, if our, in our ethnographic samples, which we were able to sequence to higher depth due to their preser better preservation, what we can see is that the uh, Mexican cultivars that were um, uh, land races that were collected more recently, they're all well nested within Eastern North American um, uh, uh, samples, including the ethnographic samples in red. 
And likewise, the Eastern North American wild populations are the ones that share the most recent common ancestor with all of these domesticates. So this is still quite consistent with the um, uh, traditional model of a single domestication center in Eastern, the Eastern and Central US. Um, however, you know, that doesn't exclude the possibility that there was a second domestication center in Mexico and that those archaeological seeds actually represent a second uh, domestic second origin of cultivated sunflower, um, but that that lineage went extinct and no longer contributes to modern genetic um, material. Uh, and uh, we are have the opportunity, um, thanks to a collaboration with David Lentz, um, an anthropologist at the University of Cincinnati, uh, who um, was able to obtain permission to uh, look at one of those archaeological seeds that remains from um, the Cueva de Gallo site in Mexico that dates back to about 2300 years. Uh, originally, we thought that all of these had been um, uh, destructively sampled for carbon dating, but um, this one still exists. Uh, and we've now been able to extract DNA from it. Um, and the endogenous content is uh, pretty good. So about 10% of the reads that we recover um, are uh, from sun match to the sunflower genome. Uh, and um, we were just uh, very uh, generously awarded a stall award from the ARF to um, push ahead with sequencing that sample, uh, as well as another archeological sample from um, the Ozarks at the Green Bluff site, which has an uh, equivalently good amount of um, endogenous DNA content and dates even further back. Uh, and uh, we are currently um, moving ahead with resequencing libraries from both of them, uh, as well as some libraries that we'll prepare from modern wild Mexican samples that aren't really well represented in our modern wild data set, um, so that we can look further into the origins of those archaeological samples and whether they represent a single or uh, a second origin for cultivated sunflower. All right, so um, in the last part of my talk, I wanna tell you more about you know, our main goal in this project, which is identifying domestication genes and then following their diversity over time in our archeological time series. Uh, and just to give you a bit of past information about um, what we know about the genes that have been under selection during domestication and sunflower, uh, is that we, we don't actually know all that much. So uh, past population genomic studies have uh, been focused on particular candidate genes thought to be of interest for uh, specific reasons, either because they affect flowering or because they affect seed oil biosynthesis. Um, there have been some um, more less uh, uh, directed searches, more general searches um, using surveys of microsatellite diversity or um, comparing the transcriptomes of wild and domesticated sunflower. And together they've identified maybe about 150 potential domestication genes, but really to um, none of these do a good job of identifying selective sweeps and non-coding sequences in the genome or just generally capturing all of the diversity in the genome. Um, and so uh, we've moved ahead to do that by comparing the extant genomic sequences. I just want to draw your attention to one of these genes because it's personally important to me and because it's going to come up again later. And that's um, the sunflower homologue of flowering locust T or FT1. Um, this is one of several homologues in the sunflower genome. Uh, and while I was a grad student uh, uh, back in the day, um, I identified that there is a frame shift mutation that disrupts uh, the protein and actually leads it to be longer by 17 amino acids. Um, and this frame shift mutation is nearly absent in wild sunflower and uh, nearly fixed in uh, cultivated sunflower, indicating a strong selective sweep has acted on it. Um, and there's kind of a twist here is that this frame shift mutation doesn't cause a loss of function, but instead has a dominant negative effect and interferes with the uh, function of other copies of flowering locust tea in the genome and delaying flowering as a result. All right. So beyond these initial studies, uh, my postdoc, Nellis Ackman, um, has done whole genome uh, screens for regions of the genome that show signatures of selection. She's done this with a variety of population genetic tools, including FST to GMSD and G12, et cetera, that test for both hard sweeps and soft sweeps. Um, and we took it as good evidence that if a particular region of the genome showed up 
uh, as a outlier was positively identified by one of by multiple of these tests that we wanted to bring it forward. Um, within these regions, there's often um, multiple uh, genes in there. Um, they're not just limited to like a single sequence. It's a you know often a region of several genes that's involved. And so to look at that further and identify the ones that we think are most interesting to look at from domestication, we first uh, looked at the genes in these intervals to see what they do in other plant species where there's more genetic tools, ask whether there are polymorphisms in their coding sequences that could affect the protein like that frame shift in FT1. Um, we also did a bunch of um, gene expression studies so on well, cultivated and wild sunflower on different tissues sampled at different developmental times relevant to domestication traits. Um, to see whether there was differential expression or tissue specific expression that could further implicate them, say, for instance, uh, in an increase in head size or a decrease in branching and that sort of thing. Um, and so from all of that work, um, which was done both by Mellis and myself, as well as uh, two others in the lab, Peter um, and then Ali, a postdoc in the lab, um, we did what we called the big gene hunt to narrow down our candidates to ones we were most interested in. And, you know, in, you know, uh, uh, satisfyingly, genes that were identified by previous studies do come out in our candidate domestication gene intervals, and several of them you know, show good things that suggest that they are um, doing things that are different between wild and domesticated sunflowers. So for FT1, um, we saw differences in expression between wild and domesticated sunflower in the shoot apex, um, as I'd shown in uh, grad school, but then we also found that there's this really big difference in expression in the seed coat. And another function of flowering locust T is to modulate seed dormancy, which is something that has decreased with domestication. And so uh, I'm really excited that there's potentially multiple things going on with that change um, in sunflower. Likewise, a uh, homolog of an enzyme that uh, uh, breaks down active gibberellic acids, which are hormones that cause plant uh, cells to elongate. Um, the, this uh, enzyme is expressed much lower levels in land races versus wild, consistent with the fact that if you're not breaking this down, um, you're not, uh, you're leading to more active gibberellins, which means more growth in, in the cultivars. All right, so to follow these then over time, um, working with the libraries that Nathan extracted, we have done sequence capture. Um, to uh, target the candidate genes that we were most excited about. So we targeted about 400 candidate domestication genes, and then we targeted about 50 uh, neutral loci that don't show any of these signatures of selection. So we could follow them for demography to look at the questions I was talking about earlier. By doing this enrichment where you throw in short RNA sequences to, that match to the sequences you want to enrich for, um, and just keeping those, we're able to gain about 150 fold enrichment on our samples. Um, and thus be able to get good sequences out of even things that had less than 1% endogenous DNA content from sunflower uh, dating far back. So we're, we just got this data back in the last couple months. And um, so we don't have any strong analysis of it yet, but I went in um, because of my personal uh, interest to look at the, the uh, frame shift mutation FT1 and then also that other gene GA2 ox that I'd identified as a grad student because you know, I, I know what polymorphisms are important. I want to see what happened over time. Uh, so I'm going to show you what, what this looks like and kind of what we hope to see um, and compare across our genes in our archaeological time series. So as I, so here we're looking at the frequency of the frame shift mutation at T1. And what you can see, um, these are the modern samples, either Native American land races or wild samples. And you can see that for the most part, we have fully homozygous uh, for the frame shift land races and fully homozygous for the frame shift wilds. There's just a couple um, heterozygotes where there's, there's not full fixation of one or the other. Um, and if we go back and we look at the frequency of the frame shift mutation over time, uh, what we see is that the oldest archeological samples that we have are uh, homozygous for the frame shift allele, for the allele that's present in the land races. Uh, and so that indicates that the selective sweep that um, acted to increase the frequency of the frame shift mutation um, in cultivated sunflower happened quite early. Um, as we move forward toward the present, we see um, that there are occasional um, 
heterozygotes that come up as well. So um, this could indicate a couple things. It could indicate that the frame shift mutation is not actually the specific target of selection and that recombination is um, bringing other things onto the same background. Um, or it could indicate that over time, as sunflower spread, uh, there was greater uh, breeding, uh, interbreeding with wild sunflowers uh, uh, in other parts of the US as it spread out of the eastern and central US. Um, but that, that is balanced by selection um, on that uh, mutation against the migration. When we look at the polymorphisms that are diagnostic for domestication in uh, the other gene I was talking about, the, the enzyme that breaks down uh, gibberellic acids, um, J2ox, what we see is that in the early samples, now we aren't fixed for that domestication the homozygote. Instead, the frequencies of um, domestication allele homozygotes, heterozygotes, and wild homozygotes match what we see in wild samples, suggesting that the allele frequency is you know, relatively similar to, to wild sunflower in these older samples. But then as we move forward toward the present, what we see is a big change in allele frequency where now we have many more samples that have the, um, that are homozygous for the domesticated allele as we see in land races and that, that persists toward the present in both the archeological and the ethnographic samples. Um, and so unlike FT1, where we thought we, where we saw a very early sweep here, instead that sweep appears to be happening between uh, sometime between 3000 and 2000 years ago. And so our archeological time series then by comparing these two genes really indicates that we have the power um, to, to put things in bins and really you know, define early sweeps versus late sweeps during domestication um, as we look at our alleles going forward. Um, and so in terms of the dynamics of domestication, what I've told you today is that there are early and late bottlenecks in sunflower domestication. And we also see interesting patterns of haplotype turnover. Uh, there appears to be a single sunflower domestication center in the Eastern US, but um, more, more on that coming as we sequence those archeological samples um, and their whole genomes to greater depth. Uh, and that we have promising domestication genes and the archeological time series gives us the capacity to find successive selective sweeps and occur when they identify when they happen. Um, I realize I'm running over a little bit due to the um, glitch um, but I want to just talk about one more thing because I am giving this in part because of a generous stall award um, that I was given last year. I just want to give you an update on where we are with that and where we were able to get during the pandemic. Um, so the, the stall award was related to another domestication story that we've been studying in the lab, and that's Iva annua or marsh elder. Um, this is an extinct crop, so it is part of the Eastern North American domestication center like sunflower. And if you look at archaeological samples, you see that their seed size increases in volume just as dramatically as sunflower does over the last four to 5,000 years. Um, but those large seeded varieties are no longer extant because it stopped being cultivated around um, 500 to 1,000 years ago uh, as corns, beans, and squash um, moved up from Mesoamerica. Um, and uh, there was actually some early disbelief about whether marsh elder was actually cultivated, um, in part because uh, it's not mentioned in any early edible plant books um, and it's not cultivated by modern tribes. And then uh, marsh elder is kind of a nasty plant. It's more closely related to ragweed uh, than sunflower, even though it's still in the same family as sunflower. Um, so it's, it puts out a lot of pollen and um, is kind of sticky and gross. Um, and so uh, it seems an unlikely choice, um, potentially hard to harvest. Um, uh, but uh, the archaeological evidence is pretty clear that um, uh, large marsh elder seeds are found in coprolites um, and even in intestinal tracts of mummies. Um, and this, uh, the seeds are high in nutritional content. Um, and so it does appear to have been cultivated um, and consumed. Uh, over time. And so we want to understand this more and compare what's gone on with marsh elder domestication to what's gone on with sunflower domestication in order to uh, ask that, that question genetically, really in the short term, what we need to do is get a draft genome that's going to support our archaeological DNA studies. Um, we've been doing this slowly over time, uh, in part through collaboration with Robert uh, Costello and others at the um, National Museum of Natural History. Uh, where a summer um, molecular biology uh, boot camp um, in the lab at the museum called the Yes Global Genome Program. Um, the students there 
I did a boot camp before going on to do individual projects with uh, mentors to learn the skills of molecular biology and genomics um, by extracting sunflower DNA and doing some light sequencing. Um, since then, uh, we've learned that doing light sequencing is not going to be enough because the IVA annua genome is quite large. It's 8.25 gigabases large. That's um, uh, about two and a half, more than two and a half times the size of humans and uh, similarly larger than sunflower. Everything around it um, is uh, about half that size, suggesting that um, increase in genome size happened uh, recently due to a high proliferation of repetitive DNA content. And that makes genome assembly a real big pain in the butt um, and for which we need a lot of genome coverage. And so we've been gathering that over time as I've been able to devote resources to this. And we, even um, by doing a whole bunch of um, short read sequencing with Illumina, uh, as well as some um, long read sequencing with PacBio, that wasn't enough coverage to really bring together a draft genome, not only because the repetitive elements there are many, uh, but also because they're long, um, which prevents uh, reads matching to each other in a way that then leads you to reassemble the book of the genome, as it were. Uh, and so we were uh, generously awarded a, a Stahl Award last year. Um, to do additional genome sequencing. And so we've now completed that. Um, the QB3 Genome Core um, created libraries to run on um, uh, technolo nanopore technology, the Prometheon instrument that produces really long reads, reads that are much longer than the um, repeat lengths that uh, we think were, were, are foiling us. Um, and the data just came back this month and it looks really great. We got large amounts of sequence and the um, N50, which is the size, uh, uh, the, 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 the size of kind of the, like 50% of the reads are larger than this length. The N50 is 43 KB. So that's, you know, um, three or four times the size of what we think the repeat lengths are. Um, and together that gives us another 30 X coverage of the genome. Um, and so I really, if this doesn't bring together the genome, I'm not sure exactly what will. And Vanessa Gonzalez, our collaborator at um, the National Museum of Natural History is pushing this assembly forward. All right, so with that, I'll end there. Um, thank the many people who've been involved. I tried to highlight them as I've gone along, as well as the many collaborators on this work, both uh, in terms of the archeologists or the anthropologists, the museums, um, uh, the genomicists, and then the many sources of funding. Um, and I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. Thanks so much for a great talk. Um, we've got a couple of questions here from Christine Hasdorf. Um, okay. I'll ask those and then great. if anyone else has any others, um, then uh, feel free to put them in the chat, but I also don't want to keep you too long. Um, so Christine asks, what models could you come up with uh, for this shift of the two classes over time, back and forth, have you linked it to the archaeology with uh, Smith and Vermillion? Yeah, so um, we we have not dug too deeply into that yet. Um, the the uh, the qu the cliff dweller culture in the Ozarks, um, you know, it is they is those sites were continuously occupied. Um, it seems, and so. Um, I, we haven't dug too deeply into whether we see uh, into the archaeology because I really want to see what the the, um, the nuclear DNA tell us. Um, the chloroplast DNA, it's really you know it's one marker. It tells you a lot about um, you know the kind of maternal breeding history, but there could be a lot. There could be other things that are are going on. And so if we see wholesale uh, replacement of um, you know different. Uh, genotypes across the genome, then I think there's there's really strong evidence that we should dig in and try to ask uh, the, the harder questions about um, who's occupying the site or what they're doing uh, in terms of the the cultivars that they're they're growing. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and one more question from Christine. Sure. Uh, regarding the Mexican data at this yeah. point. Uh, you're still seeing one domestication in the U.S. southeast, which seems like you may have yeah. gotten to. Yeah. Um, how and when did the specimens move south to Mexico, um, and was there a relationship with the wild taxa there? 
Yeah, good question. So, um, yeah, so there, so there, are the, so there are land races from the Hopi and Havasupi tribes um, in the American Southwest, and they those those cultivars are quite genetically distinct, um, but still you know share a more recent common ancestor with each other uh, than with anything uh, uh, else. Um, and but they 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 branch off early. Um, so I do think that um, cultivated sunflower made it at least to the American Southwest uh, quite early. Um, when it made it down into Mexico, um, I mean, the, the samples from 2300 uh, years before present are pretty compelling. So if it moved down there by, by trade, um, then I think it was down there by then. Um, however, uh, for sure, uh, um, the, what, what remains that, you know, those, those archeological remains also could, you know, that could represent a second origin um, rather than uh, things moving, moving south um, from the Southwest. And um, the, as far as any modern samples that we've gotten from that area, um, they're, you know, they show much closer affinity to North American wild sunflowers than native Mexican wild sunflowers. Um, however, that, bit of endogenous content that we got to confirm that we had enough to like push ahead with whole genome sequencing and we weren't going to break the bank. Um, you know, if we do a lane of sequencing and get 400 million reads and only 10% of them are sunflower, that's still 40 million reads to do something with. Um, as opposed to if it was like 1% and then 4 million reads wouldn't get us a lot for, for the size of this genome sunflower has. Um, the Where the chloroplast haplotype comes out uh, is it's kind of its own thing. Um, and it's uh, pretty different from anything that we've, we've got sequenced. Not, not so different that it looks like a different species, um, but uh, yeah, I, that's why we need to sequence more Mexican wild. Um, and then also, you know, again, it's just one marker and it could be local interbreeding um, post-domestication. And so really getting that whole genome data will um, let us tease apart the potential explanations of second origin versus single origin with introgression. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, reasons to stay tuned, folks. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and this has been a delightful discussion. Great. And thanks so much for bearing with me uh, as I transition to a more stable source of internet. So, yeah. Of course, at least, at least uh, all